So what is the deal with the Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword? <laughs> There's no overworld. I mean, it's just like these three small areas. Like, what's up with that? <laughs> and then you got Fee. Like, hello, who ordered this iRobot in the game? Ooh, I don't see a Will Smith get anywhere. New material. <laughs> we went over this in like 2011, you hack. And it's... Uh... Oh man, I'm gonna have to do the B-movie now. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword finally joined its 3D brothers and sisters in getting a HD remaster of its original game. The big difference between this game and the other four though is that this one wasn't necessarily heralded as a universal masterpiece. It seems like it was just yesterday that Skyward Sword released to raving critic reviews, some asking the question if it would ever beat Ocarina of Time. You know, there's been a lot of talk as to whether or not this game could knock Ocarina of Time off its pedestal. And Which was soon followed by fans getting their hands on the game and having the almost exact opposite reaction. The critique was mixed, to say the least. On the whole, there were a lot of added things people didn't like, which in the context of 2011, sadly meant people overlooked a lot of the greatness the game had within. I'm sure we're all aware of the Zelda cycle by now, and how Skyward Sword has slowly but surely made its way from being loved, to hated, to almost loved again. Actually, when I recently made my Twilight Princess video, one of the most frequent comments I got was how Skyward Sword is actually the most underrated of the franchise, and I have no idea what I'm talking about, and I'm actually a hack fraud! So with all all of these missed opportunities and thoughts brewing over the last 10 years, I think now is a good time to take a deep dive into Skyward Sword's new HD remaster and discuss just what is the go with this game. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it the most underrated Zelda game? Oh, real quick, I think it would be good context as well to explain that I played this game once in 2011 when it released, and I loved it. I was standing up in the lounge room swinging my Wiimote around like it was a real sword. I then played it again in 2016 and I thought, nah. It wasn't bad, had problems, but I liked it. And now I'm playing this new version with almost a new pair of fresh eyes. Oh, and by the way, I will be spoiling pretty much every aspect of this game, so you've been warned. But anyway, strap your Wiimote on, calibrate it to the fucking table, point it at the center of the screen, and enjoy the ride. And we have to start that ride with the big elephant in the room. <laughs> The Wii had a gimmick, motion-based gaming. At the start of its lifespan, this was just through the use of an accelerometer inside the Wiimote, which meant it could only really detect whether the Wiimote was moving or not moving, essentially acting as a glorified button. This is why the Wii version of Twilight Princess didn't have one-to-one -one sword play, but used the Wiimote as a fake B button. This time around though, the Zelda team were able to use the Wii Motion Plus, which could accurately detect the position of the controller in a 3D space. The idea of being able to use the Wiimote as a sword in Zelda just felt like one of the most natural ideas to come from this technology. And with the swordplay game and Wii Sports Resort being so fun and successful, the idea seemed promising. But the thing is, the gaming audience in 2006 were way more on board with the idea of motion controls than the audience in 2011. So they'd have to do a lot of convincing to get people keen. And demonstrations like their E3 reveal of the game didn't really help. Everything went really well in our rehearsals. Yikes. Motion controls are so entwined into the DNA of Skyward Sword. Every single aspect of this game, from the movement to the enemies to the puzzles and everything in between, are designed with motion in mind. This isn't a case of just slapping them on last second onto a standard Zelda game like with the Wii version of Twilight Princess. No, this game is built from the ground up to be a motion-based experience. So how are they? When they work, they're fantastic. Once you get used to it, swinging your sword in its nine directions becomes very instinctual and fun, and I love how it turns every boring enemy from previous games into a unique puzzle. They can block your attacks with their own swords, and you have to get a lot better at identifying which stroke is going to successfully defeat them. And it's so fun that some items become so enjoyable to use just from having this immersion. Things such as swinging the whip back and forth, or getting quick shots sent off with the bow, or catching bugs with the net. Dude, I, I spent so much time using the net. It was so fun. I saw a bug and it was like, I have to catch it. Zelda? You need saving? <laughs> yeah, so does this sky beetle in the tree here. Who do you think's more important? It, it, it's the it's the beetle. I just want to clarify that it's the beetle. I mean, Zelda can't exactly help me upgrade a stamina potion, can she? She just gets sucked into tornadoes every five seconds. I mean, come on. So when the controls work, they feel great and make this such a unique experience. But when they don't, it can be really aggravating. Like sometimes you need to move your sword to the left before you can swing it right. But when you go to do that, it just swings left, causing you to be parried or attacked. And what should be easy tasks becomes slightly infuriating when you realize how many actions have been changed from previous Zeldas to be done in 
entirely by motion. For example, you can't just Z-target a hookshot pad or Z-target an enemy with your bow and arrow. You have to aim it with the Joy-Con. And then you've got things like the boss key, which just really skyward my sword. Every single key to the boss is this weird 3D perspective puzzle. And I remember having a disdain for it on the Wii, but because the Joy-Con controller is about a billion times smaller than the Wii's, it just feels so awkward and like you have very little wiggle room to actually move the thing around. And then the swing, bro, fuck off. Why do I have to swim with the motion controls? You walk, move, run, control link entirely with the left stick. And then when you're underwater, it's all up and down and all around, bro, what? I have to turn the motion controls off for the flooded Farron Woods section. I, I just, this sucked. But that's one of the big changes added to the HD version. Despite them claiming for years and years that they could never release a version of Skyward Sword without motion controls, they released a version of Skyward Sword without motion controls. The sword is swung entirely by the right stick, with other actions mapped to various other buttons. Personally, I didn't really like it. I'm very glad they're in, but because I know so many people hated the original, and I've heard a lot of stories about people with disabilities having to miss out on Skyward Sword, but can now give it a shot with this new control scheme, which is awesome. But personally, I just prefer the motion controls. I I know that may seem to contradict all of my previous statements, but when they work, they really do just work. You get so used to controlling this version of Link in this specific way, and it almost becomes this new sub-game within the franchise. I think because when it's good, it feels really nice, the bad parts stick out like sore thumbs. There were just one too many dumb decisions made. Like, why do I have to fly with the motion controls? Why do I have to dive with the motion controls? Why do I have to swim with the motion controls? Why do I have to draw pictures on the wall with motion controls? Why do I have to hold Zelda's hand with the motion control? Actually, you know what, no, no, just keep that one. Nice. A lot of people have asked me if the motion feels better than it did on the Wii. Um, maybe? I haven't played the Wii version in a hot minute, but I remember really liking the motion controls and having very little problems with them. Except for the annoying table calibration thing, dude, what? Here, however, I did run into a couple of persistent issues. Because of the lack of a sensor bar, anytime you do anything that requires pointing at the screen, the Joy-Con uses its gyroscopic sensors to emulate that function. It does not emulate it well. The amount of times I'd shoot something with my bow, run for five seconds, and then pull my bow out again, and my view was drifting all over the place, oh, it was awful. It's also really hard to get precise shots with things because the technology is just less accurate than an infrared tracker. As a whole, you have to use the recalibrate button all the time. It's almost like a completely new skill you have to get good at. There were many times I'd try and charge a Skyward Strike and the sword wouldn't click into place, so I'd have to quickly re-aim and recalibrate. It did get a bit frustrating and it's not something I remember worrying about with the Wii version. But I don't know, maybe I'll boot that version up and the controls will go Brrr. But on the whole, I liked it. I think when they function properly, they're really immersive and fun and it's almost a shame we'll only ever see them in one game. But with that out of the way, let's get to the actual game itself. <laughs> Let's pretend for a second that Skyward Sword's main gimmick wasn't motion controls. Even if that were true, Skyward Sword still shook up the Zelda formula in an enormous way. Since Ocarina of Time, barring maybe the exception of Majora's Mask's incy wincy tiny Termina Field, every 3D Zelda game has housed one giant connected open world to explore. You go from dungeon to dungeon, stopping past major landmarks on the way, and having home bases of sorts to return to. In Skyward Sword, they kinda just fuck that off. Instead of one gigantic open world, the game is split into two layers. The sky, which houses many small islands and then this one big home base island with the town of Skyloft. And then there is the land, which instead of being a gigantic sprawling Hyrule, is three siphoned off small areas. To get from Farron Woods to the Lanayru Desert for example, instead of walking there or riding a horse or even the conventional magical teleport, you instead have to make your way back up to the sky and then back down to the land area of your choosing. This kinda sucks. It becomes more irritating than anything and just seems like such a bizarre choice considering exploring a giant world has been such a big appeal of the series since the start? Apparently, Nintendo were under the impression that open worlds were confusing and unappealing to the majority of players, drawing that conclusion from looking at the sales data between the 2D and 3D Mario games on the Wii. But this just doesn't work for Zelda. And the three separate areas aren't even that big or anything either. They're all really compact and tight, and are navigated in a very linear fashion. You even give yourself shortcuts on your first time around, which just negates the need to return to certain areas ever again. Huh? And then up in the great sky, it almost feels like the Wind Waker. You have all these tiny islands which you can fly your loft wing to, but only a handful of them have anything more substantial than a goddess cube on them. It just seems like such a weird choice to lay out the game this way, and something I think a HD remaster couldn't really fix. It's almost completely because of Skyward Sword that the franchise did a 180 and became a non-linear, freedom-focused success with Breath of the Wild. Despite this whiplash rubber banding though, there are a lot of ideas in Breath of the Wild that made their first appearance here. We meet the stamina bar, allowing Link to sprint to places instead of constantly rolling. I think it really 
really works here in Skyward Sword because it makes movement around the world a challenge of optimizing efficiency. In areas like Skyloft, these stamina fruits are placed just in the right spots for you to be continuously running. But in the land sections, you really have to balance the sprinting with the climbing and the swimming. And when in battle, moves like the spin attack use up stamina, meaning you can't just spam them like you used to, which I think is such a nice challenge because it means I have to actually use more than two brain cells when I fight, which is like 75% of my brain capacity, so they're really pushing it. For the very first time, we have item durability. If you block attacks, your shields begin to take damage, which is so cool. But if you parry them perfectly, the shield doesn't take any damage, so the game rewards you for performing the technique right and doesn't make you scared of using your shield like in Breath of the Wild. Then you have the sailcloth, allowing you to jump from great heights without taking damage. Yeah. Although it's really hard going back to this after the paraglider in Breath of the Wild lets you move freely around in the air. It can be so frustrating seeing something over a gap teasing and taunting you as your stupid virgin sailcloth abilities prevent you from being able to glide there, but at least it smells nice. Wait, what the fuck? That's kind of creepy. What, what? Okay, well, what else is new? As is tradition, in every dungeon you get a new item which helps you progress throughout the game. This time around there are a bunch of new items. We've got the whip, which you can use on out of reach switches or on anything grabbable. It feels really satisfying to swing it back and forth, although I would have loved it if we got some HD rumble on the pullback, you know? Then there's the gust bellows, which is just a vacuum cleaner. Dude, sick! Like, it sounds so lame, and, and I guess it kind of is, but there is something I just love about cleaning away every single grain of sand in a room. Sick, dude. You've got the beetle, this mechanical little beetle that you can fly around to hit little switches or collect rupees. It's kind of fun, but I really wish you could upgrade it to be faster or something. <gasps> That's right! For the very first time ever, you can upgrade your core items. You can make them faster, or shoot more ammo, or just be bigger. Gigonet. It wanted to die with freedom rather than live in my giganet. I respect that. And of course, the fan favorite items return, such as the bombs, the slingshot, the bow and arrow, and the claw shots. Although, and I have no idea why they changed this, but you can no longer grab rupees or small items with the claw shot. Hmm. Again, with the motion controls being the crux of the game, these items get put to good use. After getting used to it, it can be really satisfying swinging around with the claw shots, or maneuvering the beetle through tight gaps, or quickly headshotting every enemy with the bow and arrow. Oh, speaking of, I want to go over the combat a little bit. Twilight Princess was very combat focused, having you unlock a lot of special moves to make things interesting. But with the motion controls, we don't really need that anymore. I said it earlier, but I'll just reiterate for emphasis. The motion controls just completely transform the combat into something we've never seen or will ever see again. Combat becomes less about spamming a button over and over again, and more about waiting for the perfect opening and analyzing each enemy. There's so much fun to be had with even the simplest of enemies. I mean, now a Deku Barber makes you think for more than 0.5 seconds. And then when you have enemies like the Lazelfos or Mr. Skeleton, it's just a load of fun trying to find a moment of weakness and then getting the upper hand. The combat is at its absolute peak though in the final boss of the game. Demise. This guy is tough, and I mean really tough. Every attack does a massive amount of damage, and you have to read this guy's moves five years before they happen. But it's pointless because he's reading what you're gonna do ten years before you do it! God damn it, he's good! And what's great about the combat in this game is that it's flexible. I beat Demise by waiting for an opening, seeing which direction I'd have to swing, quickly getting a hit in, and then backflipping out of the way. It was tough, but god was it satisfying. After I finished, a friend told me, yo, it's so cool you did it that way. I didn't even know you could beat him the way you did, which shocked me because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. Turns out you can also parry his attacks with your shield until he's put off balance and go for the strike, or you can even raise your sword and get a lightning attack. Which by the way, I did try, but the motion controls bug it up, so yeah, thanks Nintendo. Or you can even whip out the GigaNet. Yeah, Demise, you smelly piece of shit. What are you gonna do with this, huh? I wish the game had at least 10 more bits like this. Having an insanely tough fight that you have to exploit every small advantage presented is just so fun and so engaging and it's a shame there wasn't more of this. I love how they took little bits like this and put them into Breath of the Wild, allowing players to be able to take down a foe in different ways. And also, you've probably noticed I've compared this game to Breath of the Wild a lot, and it's kind of hard not to because they both complement and expose one another. You should check out this brilliant video by Nero, which is smarter than I could ever be, and funnier than I could ever be, and sexier than I could probably ever be, and perfectly articulates how the faults of one game are the pros of the other. But the big one I have to talk about personally is what I think Breath of the Wild failed spectacularly on, but they got so right here. Replaying this game, I realized just how much I missed good traditional Zelda dungeons. There is something that just clicks in my brain when I have to explore a labyrinth-like set of rooms, advancing one puzzle at a time, defeating mini-bosses, getting keys, equipping new items, re-exploring areas with the context of said new item, and having it all conclude with a gigantic memorable boss fight and a lovely piece of heart. And the dungeons in Skyward Sword are really good, I mean, just oh, so good. 
I just love dungeons so much because they almost get to be a little pocket game within the game where the developers can explore a central theme or idea and pack it full with detail and new game mechanics via the puzzles. And the freshest thing about them as a whole is how the motion controls and the subsequent new items let fresh new puzzles come to fruition. You've got eyes which follow the tip of your sword and get dizzy. You can explore faraway nooks and crannies and hit switches with your remote beetle. Switches need to be pulled with a whip. Doors need to be unlocked in the right direction. It's just all so fun. But what's better than all these fun new mechanics is the theming of each dungeon. The Skyview Temple has this really mystical feeling to it, with all these glowing plants and this blue tinted hazy atmosphere. It is such a nice introductory dungeon that I think puts you to work thinking critically about the space you're in. And then we have the Earth Temple, which goes very heavy handed on the lava theme. But you get this cool ball to roll around the magma in, and there's this one Indiana Jones bit, so that's nice. The Lanayru Mine. Now this is where things turn up. They introduce the coolest mechanic in the whole game, the Time Shift Stones. This desert looks pretty depressing right? We'll hit one of these bad boys and suddenly this small area is transported back thousands of years. It really makes you reevaluate every room you're in, making you take note of things and wonder how they can be affected in the past or present. And I love how you see enemy bones in the present and then they'll come to life, or sometimes you'll hit them into their death, haha <laughs> suck shit. I can't state enough how good of a mechanic this is, and they knew they struck gold because they use it like a million times before the game is up, which isn't a bad thing at all because it's so interesting and it really never gets old, because they just keep expanding and evolving the concept in super interesting ways. Then a miracle happens. They have a water dungeon that is good. Best Zelda game, close up the shop, they've done the impossible, shut it down. The Ancient Cistern is the fan favorite dungeon, and for good reason. It's got this absolutely brilliant concept, basing the entire place after the 1918 tale, The Spider's Thread. You start off in this paradise of sorts, everything is pretty and lush, but to get to the boss key, you have to dive down to hell. It's all purple and yuck, and there's these undead moblins, and the atmosphere is fantastic. Then there's this very memorable moment where you climb up a single string of silk, getting closer and closer to the light of heaven, when suddenly the undead try and climb up and grab you, and it's very intense and very cool. And then you get maybe the best boss of the entire series, Oh my god, Kaloktos. Koktos. Firstly, it just looks so cool. Secondly, you have to use the whip to pull off its arms and find yourself an opening to stab its heart. And I mean, that's cool and all, but it's in the second phase where this gets amazing. When he misses a shot, you have to disarm his arm and then you can grab one of his big fuck off swords and go for a swing and holy shit, I have so much adrenaline right now. I, I might do something crazy. I might tell that girl that I like her. why or how Kaloktos is as fun as it is, but there's just something so magical about the atmosphere and the intensity of this brilliant fight. Really good stuff guys. Mr. Ayanuma, pat yourself on the back for this one. And then we have the Sand Ship, which is just an evolution of the time shift stones we saw in Lanayru Mines, but they can really put your brain to work on evaluating how the different time periods affect what you can and can't do in each room. And like all good pirate ships, there's a room full of treasure. Arr, I found the booty, but where is the booty? Sorry, I was just kidding, it was just a joke, I'm sorry. But maybe the best part of the sand ship is getting there. It's located in the Lanayru Desert, which once upon a time was a great luscious sea. So you have to hook up a time shift stone to the ship and sail across the desert. This is such a cool concept, mechanic and aesthetic, but it also sets up for this incredibly sad moment. The captain you're with needs you to grab a map. So you climb all the way to his house on the top of this tower and you find a dusty room and the remains of two other robots who have probably been dead for thousands of years. A picture on the wall reveals that these were probably his wife or family. Now it's just you and the robot who knows that all of his loved ones have passed on and as soon as the time shift stone is halted, he will return to the undeniable demise of his death. But this minecart section was sick, haha, <laughs> sorry about your dead wife, dude. Also, really quick, when you're in his house, you can open their closet and the game goes, uh, it's rude to open other people's closets. Um, they're dead. Look at them. Not really gonna complain, are they, when they're as mobile as a fucking rock. The next dungeon, the Fire Sanctuary, is probably my least favorite. Aesthetically, I always found it a bit too similar to the Earth Temple, and you spend half of the dungeon digging underground, so it becomes harder for it to leave a lasting visual impression when it looks like dirt. And you gotta fight these stupid fucking centipedes who are always too far Ask me to hit their fucking butt pimp on that fuck, fuck, ugh. Then the last dungeon, the Sky Keep, is my absolute favorite. You have these eight rooms that are based on the previous dungeons, which you must slide around on this pedestal that physically changes the layout of the dungeon. It really puts your noggin to the test, as you have to keep track of where you've been, which door is going to lead to what, and it's a really nice way for all your old items to be put to the test. It's actually pretty challenging, and that difficulty is probably my favorite thing about it, especially because the other dungeons are way too easy. I know the running joke on the channel is, ha ha, 
Oh, I'm Snug Boy. I'm so stupid. Her, da, da. Ah, but my mum actually said I'm not allowed to call myself stupid anymore. And I must have grown a gigantic brain in the last couple of months because these dungeons were a breeze. There were only a couple of times where I got stuck and it usually was me just not looking around enough. But on the whole, I really was a bit disappointed at how this children's video game didn't push my adult brain to the absolute limits of human potential. What the fuck, Nintendo? But all in all, the dungeons here are just fantastic. They're all brilliantly themed, they all have really interesting mechanics that are further expanded on in the puzzles. Most of them have fantastic bosses. I mean, you have Kaloktos, which I just mentioned, but then there's this giant scorpion, which you gotta blow out of the ground with your bellows, or this giant ball of magma, or this sexy son of a gun. The theming and aesthetic of a dungeon just makes the world feel so much more interesting to me. And a good, interesting world is something Skyward Sword also gets really right. <laughs> While on the gameplay side, Skyward Sword may have got a couple of things wrong depending on your point of view, I think in pretty much every single aspect, Skyward Sword nails its world, story, and especially its characters. One of the unexpected things I loved this time around were all the characters that inhabit Skyloft and the greater world. They've all got super unique personalities, all feel like they actually live in this world, and they have some really fun side quests. The most memorable is probably Colin giving Link a love letter to pass on to the girl he likes, which you can then give to a ghost hand in the toilet. <laughs> What? And then the hand falls in love with him and just rubs his head at night. <laughs> what? Hey, also, how do you get that in real life? Just asking for a friend. I pay well. And I love when the weak puny guy Fled wants to get stronger, so you have to give him a stamina potion so he can do push-ups. Although, he asks for two and that's kind of greedy, dude. Like, Gerudo dragonflies ain't easy to find and I'm kind of busy. God, I'm such a pro gamer. And I love all the lumpy pumpkin side quests. Upon entering, you see a heart piece on the top of this chandelier. So of course you're gonna knock it over and grab it. But apparently video games have consequences for your actions now, what the fuck? The boss man gets angry and demands you have to pay back the damage by doing a bunch of free work. You've got to deliver pumpkin juice, successfully carry the world's stupidest fucking pumpkins. And then my absolute favorite of these pumpkin themed side quests is when the boss's daughter loses her music partner. So you have to help out and accompany this cute singer with your heart. It even includes a solo section. And afterwards she says, I wish I knew someone good at plowing. Just every tiny little character makes the world so interesting. From the fake smiling shopkeeper who gets visibly upset when you don't buy his things, to the demon who wants to be everyone's friend, to Beetle, I love you Beetle! All these character side quests make the world just feel so much more alive and really cute. And everyone in this game is really cute. Oriel, I love you. And at one part she and her bird get stranded on an island and she asks you if you can help her and Oriel, I would literally do anything for you. Anything. But in all seriousness, there is one reason and one reason alone why this narrative and subsequently this game as a whole works. And it's because of her. The one and only Zelda. Taking a leaf out of Twilight Princess's book, the game opens with a rather lengthy introduction which, apart from getting players used to the new motion controls, sets up your main source of motivation. How do they do this? Through really cute romance. I didn't miss it as a kid, but oh my god, I did not miss it this time around. Link and Zelda are in love. They're so cute. Oh my god, I want them to kiss so bad. Ah! They just have this super flirty energy whilst also having this deep connection with each other. And it's so nice for Zelda to actually have a character for once. She's strong and assertive. She playfully teases Link but scolds him for not practicing. She stands up to the bullies of Skyloft, especially Groose who is so sexy I can't. But then she shows her sweet and lovely side to the boy she likes. That's us, by the way. Uh, we're Link. He's still just a canvas for the player to project themselves onto, and in this game, it just doesn't work. For the first time ever, you can choose multiple text options in conversation. So that means Link talks, except he doesn't. And what's even more awkward is that in some cutscenes, people will ask him to explain stuff, and then he starts moving his arms around and goes, oh, well, you see, this bloody thing happened, and then you know, and it's so whack. Do you want him to talk or not? Make up your mind. Don't give us this weird in-between. But back to Zelda. We spend a good hour or so getting to know her and seeing the relationship between the two of them. So when uh oh happens, your motivation is set and clear and you genuinely want to do everything you can to get her back. God, I'm getting deja vu from the last Zelda video, but I mean this is just the best way to get me to care about what I'm doing. You give me the setup time to learn about someone and give me personal stakes in them and when they disappear, of course I'm devastated and want to save them. It gives you the drive to want to progress through the game. Even when you're going through the bullshit parts, at the back of your mind, you're always thinking about her. Ah. <sighs>
and we barely catch Zelda. We just miss her after the first dungeon, and then in the second one, we only get a small glimpse of her before we get absolutely roasted by Impa. Here's the thing I didn't remember about this game. The writing is good. No, like, I mean, it's really good. No, like, I mean, Shakespeare is shaking in his grave right now. The writing here just seems like such a step up from the usual Zelda affair. Every word of Impa's really cuts through and stings. And she's right, Link sucks. While you were messing around catching butterflies, Zelda was in danger. And what from? Girahim. This sexy son of a bitch with this deliciously long tongue is so memorable. Is it because of his great design? Is it because of his brilliant music? Is it because of his tongue? No, I'm serious, what a tongue. Yes to all of the above, but to me, it's also his dialogue. His threats and phrases come out like silky smooth poetry, and while I know he's about to impale me, I gotta appreciate good art when I see it, guys. So after a big scolding from Impa, we finally catch up to Zelda and just miss her due to Girakuk. And then we get Zelda shouting, I'll definitely see you again, this isn't goodbye, Link. And then she's gone, stuck in the past through the now closed gate of time. Okay, new motivation. Activate the other gate of time to see Zelda again. But uh-oh, remember big bad bully Groose? Yeah, well he's decided to join in on the fun. This is genuinely such a good cutscene. Seeing this big guy screaming as he falls to the earth and then seeing him freak out about this entire new world and these tiny birds, <laughs> it's fantastic. And it sets in motion Groose's character arc in the game. That's right, he has a character arc. And his character arc is good. What? So after working really hard and going through many arduous challenges, we finally restore the gate of time and meet up with Zelda. And she finally explains everything. She's no longer your childhood friend who means the world to you, but she's the goddess Hylia reborn in a mortal form. And the two of you are just small parts of a massive picture. She explains who Demise is, the ravaging war which desolated the land, and their only hope to prevent the resurgence of said evil, the Triforce. That's all exposition, and it's all done well, but what really kills me is when she starts talking to Link personally. She explains how she knew Link would do anything for Zelda, knowing how close the two of them are. And there's something especially heartbreaking about the line, I used you. All that boring setup at the start was so worth it to set up emotional moments like this. She genuinely looks so guilty and like she's about to break down crying from what she's pulled Link into. So the seal over Demise's prison can stay intact, she decides to put herself into an eternal sleep for thousands of years. She's making the sacrifice of locking herself away and when Link runs up to the crystal and bangs on it in desperation, you're right there with him, desperately begging her to stay with you. Despite being the goddess Hylia reborn, she's still your friend. She's still your Zelda. And even though she is the one who would always wake you up, when the time comes, you promise to wake her up. And it is here where I had a little cry. This is my favorite Zelda in the franchise by far. It's so nice to have her have some character and play a big role in the plot. Having her and Link have a close connection just makes moments like this not only possible, but hit as hard as they do. And I mean, after that, how could you not want to do everything in your power to collect the Triforce, rid Demise from existence, and save Zelda? So you go through every challenge left and do exactly that. You saved her, everyone's happy, even Groose is here and he even has a little cry. All is good. Except, uh-oh, time travel! Oh, yeah, by the way, this game is a surprising amount of time travel. I have nothing else to say except that time travel is sick. Just before the final stroke of midnight, Girihim steals Zelda, takes her to the past, and revives Demise. Again, we get another sick speech from Girihim, but an even cooler one from the big baddie of the game. This is just epic. Sorry for using that word, but it just is. Look at this area, look at him, look at this big sword, the atmosphere is just perfect. And when you pair that with his brilliantly written villainous monologues, it's just mesmerizing. After defeating him, he places a curse on Link and Zelda, stating that whenever his hatred is reborn, so will the goddess and the chosen hero. Hence, dooming the three of them to eternal reincarnation, and explaining why Zelda, Link, and Ganondorf are always being reborn, fighting it out generation after generation. I know a lot of people think this undermines the sympathetic motivations of Wind Waker's Ganondorf, but I still think it works. And I mean, that Ganon punched a kid like multiple times, I don't care how sorry you feel for his plight. The game ends with the parting of our companion Fee. Fee? Well, I'll get to her later. This moment crushed me when I was nine. I cried and cried and cried. And while I still think it's a little sad, I don't think it's as heart-wrenching as it should be. Although her line about feeling happiness did have me feeling kind of funny. Then Zelda decides to live her life on the ground and begin the prosperous kingdom of Hyrule. She asks Link what he wants to do. He smiles at her and the camera begins to pan and wait, what? No, kiss, kiss, kiss! Don't show me a metaphor, kiss! Stop using subtext, you cowards! I'm gonna be honest, I really miss this type of Zelda. 
I love having a grand narrative filled to the brim with interesting characters with detailed personalities and having all of these elements tied up in a neat little bow which helps propel and project the game forward. I love having these things that give me a reason to care about going from place to place. I know I shouldn't harp on it too much, but comparing this style of storytelling to Breath of the Wilds, I mean this just shits on an any day of the week. In fact, replaying this, it's made me realise just how massive of a step back they took with Breath of the Wilds memory based storytelling. Every moment in this narrative is so enjoyable, so emotional, so epic, and it's all supported so well by the incredible music. Holy shit, the music is so good! as a stupid kid, the fact that this was going to be the very first Zelda with a live orchestra doing the score and having real musicians in a real studio recording real instruments for the game just excited me more than anything. While sound fonts puppeted by MIDI files produced good work for the previous entries, it's just not quite the same as the real deal. You could feel this especially in the great triumphant moments of Twilight Princess, which just didn't ring as true as they should have. <laughs> Here, holy shit guys, here, the music is so good, so good, so good, oh! There's something just so lush about these compositions and their timbre. They sound just like the game looks, like a gorgeous and lush water painting. And when they are combined with moments in the story, it just makes those bits all the more special. Romance in the air is just so beautiful and captures the feeling of this youthful blossoming romance. <laughs> The peace and quiet of Island in the Sky can't help but make you want to sit back, chug on some pumpkin juice and watch the peaceful clouds. And the absolute beauty of Follow Fee lives in my brain 24-7. There's something so enchanting and magical and mysterious about it and it's just brilliant. And one of my favourite things they do with it is when you're inside you only hear the flute, but when you go outside the rest of the instruments come in. That's one of the great things about the music in this game. It's adaptive. Taking a note out of Banjo-Kazooie's book, different areas will have different instruments playing to give these different places a slightly different feeling. When going between the different shops in the bazaar, walking back and forth between the past and present area of a time shift stone, or even in really subtle ways such as going between busier and quieter parts of Skyloft. It's such a small detail that just makes the game world feel so much more alive and dynamic. Now, remember how I said the music was orchestrated? Well, that lets moments like this feel so fucking cool. There is just nothing in this entire universe that can make me feel more powerful than a vigorously energetic orchestra. Kaloktosh just takes the cake, man. This boss is already so cool, but there is just something about swinging his own sword into his chest with that music that is insane to me, dude. Holy fuck. And there's even a musical instrument in the game. It, um, harps. Just like how I keep harping on about this game. Bloody hell, snug boy, ever heard of being concise? My jeez, lord. No. I'll make a three hours Zelda video, don't you dare tell me to be concise! Anyways, what does this new version of the game change? Is it worth a new price range? Is Groosh just as sexy in HD? Well... Before release, there was a lot of commotion online about this being a lazy remaster of the game. In fact, there was apparently a boycott for the game? Huh? And the reason for the commotion was because a lot of the changes weren't big and flashy, but rather were very small and subtle. I know I've talked about a couple of the major changes already, but I want to focus now on a lot of the tinier alterations, because there were a surprising amount of changes in this game. In fact, I didn't even realise how many tiny changes there were until I looked it up, and all of them have been for the better in my opinion. The big thing they do is get rid of all the annoying stopping and starting of the original. Like in the Wii version's opening, you'd go outside, have to talk to this guy, he'd tell you to run up a box, then tell you how to jump, and then tell you how to get a cat, and then tell you how to climb, and then tell you how to push a box, and dude, oh, it's so annoying. Now he does just like half of that, and he gives you a rupee. Thanks, dude. It's not all fixed though. 
The beginning of the Tentalus boss fight still stops me more than I'd like. And there are still some moments where Fee interrupts you and okay, we gotta talk about Fee Fi Fo Fum. She was the big problem a lot of people had in the original game. I'm happy to report that Fee is in this game a lot less. I didn't mind her when I was a kid, but I distinctly remember in 2016 being interrupted by her every five seconds and thinking, mmm, okay, bucko. There were so many times in the original where anything would happen and she'd pop out and talk to you. But it's not like she had anything useful to say. It would be like, Link, there's an 85% chance that the thing you just saw happen is happening. I suggest you proceed in doing that. Like, like okay, yeah, I have basic fucking visual comprehension for you. I could have figured it out. Jesus Christ. Now, she mostly only pops up when she has to. And if you need her, she's down the bottom there for help. And I actually did use her help once or twice. And it was quick and easy. And when it's optional like this, it actually felt helpful. So, thanks Fee. It's a far cry from the days of, Master, the batteries in your Wii Remote are- Oh, bro, shut up! And apparently they took out this hint Sheikah Stone and put all that into Fee, which makes sense, but... To be honest, I didn't even remember that being there in the first place, so... But the removal of Fee creates a new problem with the game. Her farewell hits a lot less because we just see so much less of her this time around. Additionally, her robot personality just doesn't help you form a connection with her, so... Oops. And I don't know how to fix this one. So as our Numa, you're gonna have to figure this one out on your own, champ. The other tiny changes presented I just absolutely love and they really make the game feel better. You can speed through the text or just skip the scrolling entirely. You can skip cutscenes in your first viewing. Every single NPC has their name displayed on the text box now, which I didn't even realize wasn't a thing in the Wii version. I don't know how you were supposed to remember their names and now it makes the world feel more personal and familiar. Beetle's rope comes down faster, there's auto saving and you can now choose which file to save the game to when you go to a bird statue, which also also fixes this problem at the end of the game where it asks you if you want to play again in hero mode and then just deletes your save file for some reason? <laughs> a lot of characters don't stop you in your tracks to talk to you now. You now only get told what an item is once instead of being told every single time you boot up the game. And this lack of worry that you're going to be stopped by a text box makes bug hunting a lot more fun. They really went to work at cutting all the fat of the original and transforming the game into this better paced and more enjoyable experience. But it's the next two changes that for me completely reinvigorate the game. These are the big boys, the behemoth, bigger than my love for this fictional woman, new camera controls and a 60 frames per second frame rate. They may not sound like much, but these two additions make this feel like an entirely new game. Being able to control the camera as you explore through the world just makes it so much more immersive and fun to trek through. It makes dungeons more interesting because now you can maneuver the camera around to try and find where the next secret is or look for a hidden treasure, or in general just have a way greater awareness of the physical space you're in. And in the overworld, being able to move the camera around just makes the world feel more alive. And look, it just feels better being able to move a stick instead of having to snap it behind you every five seconds. Like, how did we put up with this? Now every single 3D Zelda has a free controlling camera. Except Ocarina of Time. Haha, <laughs> you fucking loser! And then, 60 frames per second. Oh! I genuinely cannot believe that a Zelda game runs at 60 frames per second. Nintendo has just always been the weak tech company, and 30 just always seemed it. Never in my head did I even assume a Zelda would ever run at 60. Cause why would it? But oh my god, they doubled the frame rate and it's amazing. The gameplay feels so much smoother and invigorating. The cutscenes are just so much more cinematic and intense. And this guy's ass just swings with so much more dexterity than ever before. It's incredible. These two changes just give Skyward Sword this much needed metamorphosis that really kicks it into a second life. I'm so glad these were added and I really hope if we get more Zelda games on the Switch, they can boost them up to 62 because it's going to be really hard going back to 30. But despite all these changes, and again, they do make this game a lot more enjoyable, there are a few problems with this game that it is so rooted to the core of Skyward Sword that you could not get rid of them. The biggest problem with Skyward Sword always was, and sadly still is, the pacing. They've cleaned up a lot of the unnecessary halting provided by Fee, which genuinely makes the first three dungeons such a blast and so much fun. And then Zelda goes into the time gate and it's like the pace slams shut to a screeching halt. Because there's no new areas to explore, the devs just pull stuff out of their ass for you to do. Like, you gotta move these two turbines to face the same direction. And then one of them doesn't have a propeller, so you're like, uh, oh, okay, well I'm sure someone in Skyloft can make a propeller and will fit it in, but nope. You talk to this guy and he's like, yeah, nah, the propeller fell off into the clouds, lol. Sorry, it's gone forever. 
unless you revive this magical robot. And so then you have to revive this fucking robot who does nothing but talk shit to you and then licks Fee's feet. And like, I get that part, she could step on me, but dude, I just want to play the game. And then later, this fucking robot again shows up with this big basin of water. But despite the fact he can fly, you have to walk him up the entirety of the mountain, protecting him from harm. Bro, what the fuck? And he's whining and crying the whole time. And it's like, dude, shut up. And then at the end of the game, you go to Farron Woods and it's been flooded. So you go to the dragon and you ask, yo, what is happening? And they're like, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like flooding the woods, lol. So then he asks, well, actually, I need I need the song from you. So can you unflood the woods? And the dragon says to you, and I shit you not, nah, but actually I'm going to scatter these notes everywhere and you have to collect them to prove yourself. Fuck you. Not all the padding is bad though. There's a part where Link loses all of his items and you have to stealth around the volcano without being detected and that is a lot of fun. And the volcano looks really pretty like this. I almost wish they made it look like this the entire game. And the aforementioned desert sea with this brilliant world building and the minecart riding is fantastic. But what's not fantastic is them reusing a boss fight here for no reason. The boss ends and Fee tells you to get a move on, but you see all the sand and you think, oh, of course, they're gonna have a secret if you blow all the sand away, or maybe I'll find a chest or something. And then Fee stops you halfway and says, there is a 0% chance of there being a secret here. Okay, but this sucks, dude. I would rather have wasted my time with no reward than to be told by the game what I can and cannot be curious about. And after a reused boss too, I mean, come on, shame on you. But speaking of reused bosses, we have to talk about the Imprisoned. One of the most bizarre decisions of the original game was that you have to fight the Imprisoned not once, not twice, but three goddamn times. And what's more insane about this is that the boss isn't even that good. In fact, it's incredibly frustrating. You have to whack his toes off so he falls over and you can hit the seal into his head. But he starts having this electricity shoot out of him and it is so frustrating trying to catch up to him while getting knocked over by- Arr! I saw on Twitter that you don't actually need to do this though. You can just go to a higher level and jump on his head, which negates the need for the annoying toe shit, but it gives you less time to work with before the boss reaches the temple. But it's okay, because I don't think anyone in the world has ever failed at stopping this slow-ass, scaly avocado. In fact, I don't think they even programmed a fail cutscene in, because how could anyone fail this? Despite this being a major complaint with the original game, because it's so intertwined with the story, they had to keep the fight in unabridged. Uh, bro, just uh, fuck this fight. Not because it's bad, not because it's annoying, but because it's kind of boring and lame. But at least this one animation reminds me of Midna. Yeah. Repetition seems to be a big factor in this game, and it's a shame it's still so rife here. For example, every time you learn a new song, you have to watch the exact same cutscene again and again. Uh oh, sorry, actually, the color of the powder Fee shoots out of her ass was changed each time. <laughs> my bad, my bad. It's so weird that they reuse the same animation and camera angles every single time. And it's the same with the cutscenes where Link plays his harp to open the Silent Realms. Except here, it looks really jank. I mean, Fee's singing looks terrible, and Link's shoulder keeps dislocating in and out. Bro, Ow, are you okay? And it's the same thing with the sword power-up cutscenes. I mean, at least one of them is outside, but how many times can you swing your sword around and be happy about it, dude? Come on. In fact, this middle part of the game especially is just so congested with repetition and padding. But don't get me wrong, the repetition is spread all throughout the game. There are the aforementioned three in prison fights, but you've also got to fight Girihim three times, with the third being the only interesting one in my opinion. And I found it especially infuriating that you had to fly into this Thunderhead storm cloud multiple times and there was no convenient boost rock to go get there, and you had to fly really close to the portal to transition into the area, and the island you need is all the way on the other side. I get what you're trying to do, game. And with the three small areas below the clouds, you end up exploring them all like three times over, with only a slight deviation of change. I think what they should have done instead was give us maybe six small areas instead of three. This would have allowed for way less retracking and made for a greater variety of locations. I mean, Skyward Sword has no great lake, there's no really weird area, there's not even a snow area in this game, which, I mean, I love snow, why didn't they put that in? What? Okay, so I'm complaining a lot, but I mean, what were they supposed to do for the HD version? They couldn't rework this padding entirely or even take it out, because then the game would be considerably shorter, or it simply wouldn't be Skyward Sword anymore. But with all of these core problems at the heart of the game, Snugboy, please tell us, does this completely ruin the experience and taint the name of the franchise? What? No, are you stupid? What? Despite the fundamental pacing issues, despite the sometimes temperamental motion controls, despite the obvious padding, I think this is a really good Zelda game. 
It's been so nice to see people online rediscover this gem of a title and give it a second chance, which has been especially refreshing after seeing people bash it for years and years online. I think, especially in this new HD version, which I must stress once again really cuts out a lot of those minor frustrations that did clog up the original, the good of Skyward Sword undoubtedly outweighs the bad. You've got this beautifully lush world, full of interesting characters both big and small, with the former having so much more depth in life than they've ever had before. You've got these incredibly well-designed dungeons that are not only fun to spelunk through, but are so brilliantly conceived and themed. You've got this absolutely brilliant score which really just elevates everything in this game to this absolutely higher standard. And you've got Bruce, I mean literally what else do you want? I am really glad I got to play this game again, and rediscover what my 9 year old self loved so much about it. I'm so glad I got to once again enjoy this beautiful painting of a Zelda world which scratched that itch that Breath of the Wild left in me. Skyward Sword, you get the Snug Boy approval. Except they removed the instructional video, what the fuck Nintendo, this game was literally unplayable!